Hey everyone, it's Blake, and today we are going to be doing some experiments with reward functions to find what really is going to work well for us. So, to kick this one off, I actually have a little intro video that I recorded talking about reward and memory and why we think it might be important for this problem. So as we talk about biomimetic algorithms, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that these are mimicking biology, right? And uh, deep neural networks are designed to be biomimetic algorithms. Now, much like teaching a parrot E equals MC squared doesn't mean the parrot knows anything about relativity. When we talk about mimicking nature, we're finding algorithms that behave in ways similar to what nature does, but it's not really clearly mimicking uh, absolute nature. There are a few projects that do that, but that's not what we're doing when we're doing machine learning in Unity. So one of the things that we're not dealing with is memory. So, for example, if I'm dealing with my dog Watson here and I tell him to come on up, up, dad boy, and he comes up and he says hello, um, he has a very good memory for rewards, right? So I'll give him a treat and I'll give him affection and I'll tell him that uh, the command that I gave him resulted in the behavior that I wanted, and he has memory of that. However, um, the machine learning algorithms that we've been working on thus far don't have memory the way that Watson does, or almost anything that we're used to dealing with does. Right, down. Good boy. So, what we need to keep in mind is that... Um, for the dog, I have a binary reward mechanism. If he does what I want, then he gets a treat or he gets affection. If he doesn't do what I want, then he gets nothing. And that's kind of how our algorithm works right now. When we look at different opportunities or different options for rewards, one of the things uh, we can look at is gradients. Um, so by getting closer to our target position, um, we start increasing the reward the closer and closer and closer we get to where it is that we want to be. And that might be helpful because of our algorithm's structure and uh, our ability to do, to do that in a reward. Now, um, still keeping memory out of it, uh, I don't know for proximal policy optimization, which is the uh, algorithm that comes default with uh, Unity Machine Learning, um, I don't know if that will actually re react and train better with a discrete or a continuous reward mechanism. Now, certainly Watson does just fine with a continue or a discrete reward because he has memory. I think memory helps with that. But in our case, since our system doesn't have memory yet, um, you know, it may be that a continuous reward function may be helpful. The only problem with a continuous reward function is sometimes they get hard to conceptualize and it really helps to be able to to see them to visualize them uh, because you can frequently unexpectedly generate local maxima that aren't the global maxima where your algorithm can get stuck and so um, I will be taking one of our current examples so that's the advantage of having these very simple examples we've been working with is I'll be taking one of these little examples and I will make it, um, I'm going to move it to a continuous reward function, and then we're going to run the, uh, the algorithm again with the same hyperparameters, and it's just a good little project to experiment with to see what differences there are when we change the reward parameters. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, I have given the dog a, a two-hour romp at the dog park, so uh, hopefully he will behave, and I'm going to go ahead and um, make the changes to the algorithm offline because uh, you don't need to, to watch me struggle through that, um, and I'll certainly show you everything here in a minute, and so you can see what changes that I've made, and we will do a comparison to see what difference that made in our training and results. All right, so I've run my experiments. I have four algorithms. I just got the last of the runs finished. But before I go into those runs, I'm going to show you the code and what I did. So this is under 3A, 
uh, you know, one, two, three, uh, simplest, and then multi adding gravity. This is actually going to get renamed as number four because the lessons that we took from this, I'm absolutely going to apply them to the project as I'm evolving it. So again, the question is uh, discrete reward versus continuous reward. One of the first things I did is, so we go through and I added a parameter to our game. And so in this case, unmarker points is the same. So we have a minimum reward distance and a maximum reward distance. And so that just gives the algorithm some bounds to compute. What is the minimum to use? What is the maximum to use? Because depending on the function you choose, it may or may not actually break down at certain numbers, right? And a lot of times, again, a minimum reward distance, if it's zero, then for many reward functions, you'll end up with a divide by zero and it doesn't work. And so we choose 0.1 to be kind of close to zero, you know, kind of close to the target uh, without being actually zero and, and getting divided by zero errors. You can make that even smaller. The problem is what happens is as you get closer and closer and closer to zero, some of the reward numbers for some of these functions are going to increase dramatically and they're going to approach infinity. So we need to still make our reward functions something that we can wrap our head around. That's actually pretty important as we start making these scenarios complex and then having multiple things might be providing reward that we don't drown one out with another. So this kind of just helps us normalize and bound our reward values a little bit. And that's pretty important. So again, previously the reward, it got 0.1 for every action so long as the marker was 0.1 meters from the target. And if it wasn't, it got nothing. The issue we had with training was that because it was such a binary uh, uh, function, it took a long time for it to find a reward. So I have my tensor board up here. And so, you know, it took 100,000 iterations or so before we really got much of a result. And that is fine, I guess. You know, most of the time you're going to be training and it's going to have more than 100,000 iterations. But again, as you build more complex things, that might become problematic. And it's always better if we can move that earlier and see what's going on. And so I thought because uh, PPO, I believe, uses a gradient descent at certain steps along the way, um, it may make sense that a reward that actually has a descent might actually kind of provide an arrow that points and says, hey, your, your optimum reward is this way. Again, part of the downside is as you get more complex, visualizing and understanding what the reward landscape looks like becomes more difficult. So that's actually why I have this visualization. It's going to be a little hard to see uh, for those online. I used Unity's debugs draw line. But what we have here is a line that is dark further away and then gets brighter and brighter and brighter the closer it gets to the target. So that is a visualization of our reward function. I only draw that uh, because it is computational intensive to draw, I only draw that every time the scenario gets refreshed as opposed to every frame. So, um, and then the markers just say, stay there for 30 seconds or something and then get overwritten the next time that there's a, a, a reset of the game environment. Um, but again, that helps you be able to see kind of what's going on with the reward markers or the reward function. Uh, and as you build out, become more complex, your visualization may become more complex too, but that will certainly help you debug some strange behaviors because often what will happen is uh, machine learning algorithms will either get caught in a local maximum or local minimum um, area, or they will find a means to get a new global maximum value that you didn't expect. So visualizing your reward functions can be very helpful for that. So the code here is just that on our agent reset, if the visualize checkbox is checked, then I go through and I uh, show the um, a, a colored line 
that represents what the reward is at that position. And let's see here. What else have we done? So we pulled out the reward function and uh, just for modularity so that I could call it for you know this if visualize or if we have other visualized functions. Um, I, I pulled out our reward function. The distance, that equation has pretty much remained the same. Again, we have a minimum reward. Now we have a maximum reward. So that gives us the uh, range of uh, distances that our reward function will deal with. And again, that just helps us bound it so that we know how hard that problem is. And then we have three different functions. So our original function was this binary, yes or no, am I close enough, and again. You'd get a little few points here and there before it realized what was going on, and then bam, it shoots up. So the next one that I tried was this uh, logarithmic um, uh, version of this, and it was pretty good. So I believe it's that one, yes. Now, due to the nature of this algorithm, it, the reward function has a higher maximum. All right, so uh, in this case, it's not that it's really getting the, the red marker, which is the, the logarithmic one I was showing you, is this is where it's maximizing. So it's, it's not the reward level, but it's how soon is it starting to pick up and improve the reward level? And that is, you know, around 25,000 iterations instead of 100,000 iterations. So the fact that it is uh, picking up and identifying that reward function much earlier is a huge asset for the system. And then again, it evens out. Um, and it looks like it stretched out. It took it a little longer to optimize uh, that reward function, but it certainly was able to do it. Uh, the next one was just a linear uh, algorithm that I have here, and so uh, it's just an inverse. And so there it is. So in this case, the reward scale was the same, um, and it did better than the hard binary, right? So it started so the maximum reward in this case is approximately the same. Um, it's a tiny bit higher because it can be earning a reward from the very, very, very onset of the game, whereas the binary reward, the, the discrete word reward can't. Um, and so that's kind of what we're seeing, some of what we're seeing here, but it does also start learning a lot earlier. So instead of the 100,000 mark, it's probably the 75,000 mark or so that it starts picking up learning and then keeps going on. Um, the other, the last one that I have here that just finished running, although again, it didn't actually have to go all the way to half a million iterations because it was pretty clear right off uh, what it was doing. Um, that's this guy where it is the inverse of the square of the, um, error, really. So in this case, uh, our distance, and again, I'm multiplying it by 10 because the distance we're saying 0.1 is as close as we're going to measure. And then I multiply that by 10 so that we end up with one times one. And so we have a denominator of one. So as close, when we're super duper duper close, we have a denominator of one. And then when we're far away, that denominator gets bigger. And then the unmarker points, that's the same numerator as we've had for all of our other reward functions. Um, so when we're super close, it's the exact same reward as we'd get otherwise. And as we get further away, uh, it gets farther, it gets smaller and smaller. Now, this one, again, um, is able to work in the same numerical space as all of our other algorithms, which is convenient. Um, but it, much like the logarithmic uh, uh, function that we provided, that reward function, um, it got going here again. We're at, yeah, 37,000 steps. Um, it started picking up training about 25,000, a little after. Um, so we'll say, yeah, one third. Uh, you know, so it's this, this started training three times faster than our initial two. So it looks like PPO really seems to like 
this kind of function as a reward function. It, it helps the system converge earlier because you're providing enough information to say, hey, the solution is this way. Um, so that's a result as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it's an interesting result and it's a worthwhile one. I left, for the record, all of the other hyperparameters identical. Um, I thought about shortening the num total number of runs, uh, but I figured if I did shorten the total number of runs, that would um, you know, show that <clears throat> we messed with some other hyperparameters because it, the system does adjust learning rate and other things based on how long is your total run. So I didn't want to kind of poison the settings, right? I wanted to do, I, I think, a, a very consistent scientific-ish uh, study to say how do these different algorithms behave. And I think we have a very clear result. Um, dealing with logarithms is often kind of a pain in the butt. Um, I remember back from some of my genetic algorithms days that uh, dealing with this squared error, so either you square the error or you you know have the inverse of the squared error for a reward, um, this seems to work well, and that absolutely seems to be holding true for the system at this time. Um, again, your problem may be different. How you need to approach it might be a little different, so I certainly encourage you to... Uh, you know, think about it and experiment with it. But again, having this just these small little projects that represent the larger ones are really good for experimenting with, making sure that you get some kind of apples to apples comparisons, understand what's going on, and then you can build and extrapolate from that. So um, I'm very happy with this. I'm going to move this from a from a appendix project to actually um, put this in our, our main line of projects. Uh, because this does absolutely show an improvement of performance and uh, earlier training and getting results better. So um, I'm really happy about that. If you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free. Leave them in the comments below, and I will talk to you next time.